Hey, what's up? Welcome to the stream. So glad of you to join. Hopefully audio is good. I'm still figuring this kind of stuff out. So, hey, bearded twitcher. First time. Hey, welcome, man. I think, man. <laughs> Hopefully, man, if I got it right. Um, So I'll give a couple uh, people a couple of minutes to kind of roll in. Oh, my goodness. Kyarb? Did I pronounce it right? Kyarb? <laughs> That's a rough one. <clears throat> uh, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Uh, so my name is Ty. And oh, wow. My uh, my green screen is really weird today. Ah, about, about the best I can do right now. So, <clears throat> CJ, no. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop guessing. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, everybody, audio's okay. Just bearded. We'll just call you bearded. I consider, I considered uh, trying to pull off like maybe the bearded blacksmith or uh, the bearded bard, but I don't sing. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, well, let me start off while people are rolling in here. Let me talk about uh, you know what I do, uh, what Table Flip Foundry is about. Um, why the heck am I the one teaching a class, and uh, you know why you should. Uh, pay attention or listen to me as opposed to anybody else. Um, so my name is Ty. I own a company called Table Flip Foundry. And we have a um, we have a lot of, of different avenues um, to our business. Um, we do have an Etsy store. We sell 3D printed minis on our Etsy store. Um, and then we try to sell a lot of like immersion type products. Um, we have an artist on staff who will do like custom character sheets and we have the ability to print custom battle maps, like full size battle maps, things like that. So we have this sort of like idea that tabletop gaming should be as immersive as possible. And we offer um, products that try to help that we we're developing some, you know, potions that go on a shelf in your gaming room and, and things like that. On the other side of that, uh, we do professional pre-supports. So if you um, buy a Kickstarter, there's a, a chance that we did the pre-supports for that Kickstarter. So um, if any of you guys are resin printing and you've come across, let's say, like the Uncharted Lands Kickstarter, uh, we did the supports for that. So there's been a lot of time and dedication and effort into developing a system that makes that makes 3D printing in resin really easy for you. Well, my assumption lately, and maybe some of you guys are like this, um, is that we might have gotten our first uh, resin printer for Christmas and we're still figuring out the ins and outs of what does it do? How does it work? Um, and I, I just kind of wanted to go over a few like of the basics to try to get you a really good understanding of like, what is the printer? How does the printer work? Um, things to look out for, a couple tricks on on let's say things like cleaning and, and, uh, and then we're going to touch on, um, supports. What are supports? What are they meant to do? Um, and we're not going to get super deep into like support theory. Um, we teach another class for like pre support specifically, but I want to give you like a broad overview, get you really familiar with, um, you know, what's this tool you're working with and how can we use it the best way possible with the best understanding possible. So, um, I've been printing since 2018. I think I've been resin printing since 2019. Um, I've had my own Patreon. I, um, am not much of a sculptor, but I'm more of an engineer. I used to, to have a Patreon called the table, uh, tabletop engineers. Um, and now we've sort of like shifted gears and we're, we're supporting artists who are really good at what they do today. We're going to have a, not really sneak peek cause he's sort of advertising it right now, but um, there's a Kickstarter coming up called The Barbarian by the Lions Tower Adventure Guild. And we are going to have a look at the model like in 3D today. We're going to learn a brand new um, like pre-support or auto-support method that I can't, it's like a workflow that I came up with 
This is not a workflow to be used for like professional work. This is just like a quick and easy for anybody who's new, doesn't quite have all of the, the uh, like ins and outs of supporting down or just want to hammer out a, a model real quick, like as a one-off. So this doesn't take into account like ease of removability, anything like that, but it's a very sophisticated workflow that uses some features in Lychee that um, even some of some of the, the Lychee staff were a little surprised to hear that Lychee worked this way. And so um, so it's, it's like this really cool feature uh, in the way that Lychee works that allows us to sort of um, identify certain aspects of a model. So well, let's let's start with the beginning. We'll go from the beginning all the way to, to printing and, and let's just kind of talk about what's a 3D resin printer, how does a 3D resin, resin printer work, and then some of some of you guys that are here, I, I know at least Mr. Square Pig, uh, he knows this stuff. Um, so unfortunately, I gotta I want to go through this stuff before we get to the the auto support method, um, and uh, and then we'll we'll sort of go from there. So so I'm gonna talk in general about just the normal um, resin printers that that like the average consumer is used to. So the average consumer is going to be using uh and there's lots of brands out there um any cubic frozen elegoo epax there they all have um have like some options for resin printing and they all sort of generally work the same so we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna kind of break it down to the very the very base like what is this how does it work so in uh, in resin printing, you basically have this resin with a photopolymer in it. And that photopolymer, and hopefully I use all of the right exact terms for this, but this, this, this resin will start to harden once it's come in contact with, with UV light. So the way these printers work is they use a, um, a UV light source and that light source is usually called a parallel array. So I'm going to bring some stuff up on screen here. We're going to kind of understand some of these terms. Oops. Uh, we're going to understand some of these terms together. Thing. All right. So let's have a look at a, at a parallel array. Okay. So this is... Um, let's see. This is what we'd refer to as a parallel array. So each one of these, these little bubbles has a UV light underneath it. And these little bubbles are lenses and they're, and they're specifically designed to, um, to make light travel in a parallel direction. It actually creates like a lamellar light wave, so to speak, so that, that when when the UV light goes off, all of the light will scatter and kind of go every direction. This lens will sort of pull it in and bring it into a straight line and sort of focus the light in a very, very precise way. So this um, parallel array is underneath your masking device, which is an LCD screen. And what will happen is these lights will turn on and shine light to the bottom of a, a vat full of resin. And that vat full of resin cures in a very specific pattern. So beneath that, or I'm sorry, above that is a, is a, an LCD screen and it'll look this, this is one, um, probably for, oh, looks like maybe for a photon or something like that. So this LCD display goes above the. Um, UV array and you can actually see here that LCD display is used to mask UV light from hitting the resin and when it blocks that UV light in a certain shape only the light that passes through will hit the resin and the resin will start to harden in that specific shape um, so what you have above that is is this vat which is just a big bowl full of resin and And these vats have a specific 
type of plastic called FEP. And one of the new technologies is called NFEP, which I think is for not FEP. Um, and that that bottom is is perfectly clear. It's crystal clear. And UV light will pass through that bottom layer into this tub full of resin. Then what will happen is we have a, a build plate, which is where our part is connected. So you can kind of see the build plate inside the vat here. That build plate will sort of come down really close to the screen, but with just a small, small uh, gap in between. That UV light will pass through the LCD screen in a very specific shape. It'll pass through the FEP and it'll, it'll hit the resin and it will penetrate the resin, but it will only penetrate the, the size of the gap between the FEP and the build plate. So what will happen is that you will get a very precisely shaped hard piece of resin in that teeny gap. After that, the build plate will lift itself and separate that resin from the FEP sheet. Now this part's really important. The FEP sheet is specifically, um, it's, the reason we specifically use FEP is because it, it's, it's um, ability to grab the resin is less than the build plate's ability to grab the resin. Which means every time that build plate lifts up, it's very, very likely, and sometimes you'll have, there, there'll be issues occasionally, um, and we'll get into some of those issues, but it's very, very likely that the the resin is going to stick to the build plate and not stick to the FEP sheet. And that's that's sort of like the cornerstone of the function of this um, of this printer is that the, the things stick to the build plate <laughs> and not to the bottom of the vat. So then what will happen is the build plate will go up, it'll come back down, but it'll come back down slightly taller like with a bigger gap and then there will be a a new layer where the light turns on it it um the lcd sh will shape in a certain shape it will cure in that shape which is the next layer and it will um gradually build now we're going to take a look at this in lychee slicer we can kind of give a um we can we can actually see what the screen would do um, with lychee slicer here um, and we'll get into what the slicer is and how that works but here's a, a perfect example so here we're going to get like halfway up so this white area is where the screen would be on 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 this particular layer so this layer is uh, layer 547 and on layer 547 these white lines are exactly what the screen will will activate and it will black everything else out. The UV light will turn on for a duration of time, depending on the printer. And then these shapes will cure as a hard layer um, on your 3D print. And then what will happen is the, the vat will pull that up off the FEP and it'll go up to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. And it will gradually change its shape based on the object. And what we're seeing here is basically a super sped up timeline of what would that look like every single time this white section changes, this is a change in the LCD screen. And you can see it builds on itself each layer by layer. So that's pretty much front to back. That's how a 3D printer makes an object in 3D, just curing these layers of, of resin one at a time and building an object up. So how do we get that? Like, what do we, you know, what do we put in the printer? How do we get it to the printer? So in order to get this digital file, this 3D model into your printer, you use a, a program called a slicer. Um, there are a few slicers out there. Um, I'm not going to say that some are better than others. I can tell you that I personally use Lychee Slicer and I use their pro version, which is a, a paid version. Um, they do have a free version. It's totally okay to use the free version. I would definitely recommend um, getting the paid version. I used to use a different a different software and I used it for years and I was very comfortable with that software. And then a good friend of mine comes to me and says, hey, have you tried Lychee yet? And I was like, nope, I'm good. I don't need anything else. I've got this down. He's like, listen, go get it. Try it out for a few hours and you're going to change your mind. And... I, I did. I took his advice. I did exactly that. 
a few hours later, I was already paying for pro. <laughs> and then, um, and then I've never looked back. I've never swapped. I've never needed a swap. This does everything and more that I need to do. So when I teach these classes, they're always going to be, um, done with Leechy. So, uh, so you need this software in order to create a file that goes into your 3d printer. Now this, um, this software will take a solid object and we call it a slicer because what it does is it'll take that solid object and slice it into the layers and give those layers to your printer so that the screen knows what each layer shape is supposed to be like. Um, so we can kind of view that. Let's bring in just a random object. So here's our random solid object, not really in layers. And here we can actually see these are all the layers that that your printer would print in order to to make this cube happen so when you go in to uh, lychee you're going to need to add your printer now these are all the printers that i have in my in my print farm um, but let's say we're adding a new printer let's say we just got a new any cubic um I don't know, mono. I got the mono X. So let's say we just got a new mono X. So we want actually let's do a let's do a completely let's do a completely new printer that I don't own. Let's let's do a printer I wish I had. How about the um let's see, I have some frozen printers. They have a the Sonic Mini 8K is coming out. Uh how about the Mega 8K? I would love I would love to have the the Mega 8K. Uh, so we just launched the Sonic, uh, the Frozen Sonic Mega 8K, and we noticed that we don't really have any brands or resins or settings or anything like that. So this is a process we have to start with. We have to tell the slicer what type of printer we have, and then we have to come up with a way of figuring out, you know, settings to start. So I used to use um, a printer by a company called Anycubic called the Photon. Now the photon is from a different age. It's sort of like the dark ages of 3D printing. And the amount of time that UV light would have to be on each layer was about 14 seconds or so. Well, the technology has gotten way better and these new monochromatic screens have come out. And now the layer times are, you know, two to three seconds in, in that range. And so we need to know, are we printing at 14 seconds or are we printing at two seconds? And so when we add a new resin, um, Lychee offers you some community created, um, like it's basically a, a bunch of settings that the community has sort of agreed are pretty good. And uh, some of these are great. Some of these are not great. You, you just, um, when you first start, you're just going to have to kind of dial it in. We are releasing our very own calibration method coming out very soon. And, um, and this method is going to help everybody, whether you're brand new or super experienced to get the easiest to read, simplest method for dialing your, in your printer. But when you first start, it's okay to come in here, try to find a um, one of these that has a lot of this, like this one has done five, five prints. Um, it's got 17% success. So we can kind of like go through this and let's say 2.8 seconds and we want to use this profile. So what will happen is we are cr now creating a, a resin profile that we are going to use to print our first part. Now, this is probably not going to work great at first. Soon, uh, or, or like soon you're, you're going to get into calibration and all that stuff, but we need to start somewhere. So this is how you sort of like you pick your, pick your printer, you pick the resin profile you think is going to work best. Um, and this is a part that we're not going to dive too deep into this any further, um, but it's, it's pretty explanatory. You go in, you pick your resin, you pick your color, you see what other people are doing. You can kind of start there. So let's say, I'm gonna delete this because I don't actually have this printer. Um, so let's say you find something at works. Today, we're gonna be talking about the Sonic Mini 4K. Um, I, I tend to use this Frozen Aqua uh, 4K Gray. And for testing, I always use 50 microns. 
So these are these are my settings here. So if you have the the Sonic Mini 4K and you use this resin, take a screenshot, take a note. These are the settings that I use. Um, so now let's talk about a little bit of detail in regards to um, like what do these settings do? How do they work? Um, and what and what does it all mean? Because this this is a really important aspect of 3D printing. If you don't understand the variables involved with with the prints and when you have a failure you're not going to know how to solve that failure and it's really important um, that you learn that as quickly as possible um, so let's talk about some of these some of these settings <clears throat> so on the sonic mini 4k um, we have on the left side is called burn in layers the burn in layers are the very first layers that you print these layers very specifically are designed to make sure the print sticks to the build plate right if it's got a weak adhesion to the build plate you might find that your print is stuck to the fep sheet and nothing comes out of the vat and then you have to clean and empty and do all this process so these first layers are very very important these first layers get a very long exposure time so you can see my normal exposure time which is how long the hey thanks so much uh slice i appreciate you coming by um i'll post this to, uh, video to youtube and you can check it out later um so exposure time specifically is how long that light is actually on and exposing itself to the resin so my normal layer exposure time is only 2.8 seconds my burn-in layer time exposure time is 25 seconds so you can see it's it's a little over or a little under 10 times longer that that screen is on we do that because we need those first layers to stick to the build plate and the longer we expose the harder that resin gets and the harder it will stick um, to the build plate the transition layer count this is sort of a new thing they they never really had this uh in the past and this is a fantastic uh, setting that's on a lot of printers now this transition layer count is if so let's say we have six layers um for our burn-in layers that's our first six are burning in at 25 uh seconds per layer the transition layer count will actually take the next layer and it will be, and I'm going to make up some numbers, but you'll get what I mean, is it will be, the next layer will be 22 seconds, and the next layer will be 18 seconds, and the next layer will be 12 seconds, and then 7 seconds, and all the way down. So what it'll do is it'll go from 25 seconds down to 2.8 seconds over 5 layers. What this does is this allows for a less, a less harsh transition from a really hot long exposure to a much shorter exposure uh bearded said uh our bottom layers in addition to the models layers or are they first layers of the model exposed longer uh super good question that will become very apparent when you start to see a, a prepared model 95 percent of the time maybe more those first layers are going to be part of your support structure and not even be part of the model at all we don't print with models directly on build plates very often. And as we start to get into the support section, that'll that'll just become abundantly clear to you. Um, so those bottom layers are usually part of a raft that holds up the model as opposed to the model itself. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. So those transition layers will, instead of having it go from 25 seconds right down to 2.8 seconds, um, there's a big gap there and what can happen is those layers, um, like there's a lot of temperature, uh, um, variants happening inside the, the printer and that difference between the exposure between those layers can sometimes cause like a delamination. So the layers won't quite stick together very well because they're just so different from each other. And that transition layer count will sort of like gradually, bring those numbers closer together and give you a better chance for um uh, for adhesion between those next layers so um light off delay is um is how long the light 
So it prints, let's say it, it, the build plate goes down, it, it turns the light on for 25 seconds. The light off delay is how long the light will be off between layers. So it'll turn the light off for seven seconds. The build plate will pull up, come back down. It'll wait, probably wait, and then turn back on. And then 25 seconds, then it'll turn off. And then the build plate will go up and down. It'll wait at seven seconds, then turn on. The reason it does this is because that the act of resin curing is, is exothermic. So it creates heat and that heat needs to sort of like relax a little bit, so to speak. And so by leaving that light off for a, a little bit, you can kind of get the temperature to, to regulate itself a little bit before turning back on, creating all that heat and, and then starting all over. So when you have the light on for that amount of time, we want to make sure that we're not overheating our LCD screen. That screen is a consumable part. You will have to replace your screen after so many hours. And those hours are, are essentially equate to like how much time has that screen been subjected to higher temperatures. The LCD, like the liquid crystal, doesn't get along with heat very well. And so eventually it will die and eventually you'll buy a new screen and then you'll replace your screen. But the longer, the cooler we can keep that screen, the longer the life is going to be. So some people will turn this off. They want to go, 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 go. And that's fine, but you're, you're shortening the life of your screen. So I prefer uh, to keep my screen as long as possible, and I keep a seven-second layer. Um, the lift distance is how far will your, your build plate lift off the FEP before it comes back down. If you have a really, really big... Uh, 3d printer that lift height will have to be taller that f the FEP film is kind of stretchy and it will dome up as you start to pull that it'll it'll pull that with it hey julian how's it going thank you i know it's super late there it's it's probably two probably 2 30 in the morning over there so i'm so glad you at least made it and said hi um, so anyway, your, you know, your lift, your lift distance is, is relative to how much your FEP sheet is going to stretch as it pulls up on the, on the printer, the speed. Um, I don't mess with the speed very often, but it's how quickly it's going to lift up. If you lift up too quick, um, you could, you could kind of damage the part if there's a lot of, um, if there's a, a lot of connection. Yeah. Super late. <laughs> Um, I think Thomas said he, he would wish he could make it. And, um, if you guys don't know, um, Julian works for, um, the Leachy team and, uh, I'm actually, the, I'm, this might be the first time I've spoken with them, but, um, they're always super nice and they come. And if you guys don't, if you guys don't use Leachy Slicer, you need to, but if you have Leachy Slicer, you need to join their discord. So uh, I have, I have questions occasionally, or I'll notice something that I'm having a, a struggle with and I'll go there without fail. Every time one of their team is, is there to respond and message and help me out or let me know that it's, it's being looked at or, or that it's a known issue. So, uh, thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, I don't mess with the list feeds very often. Um, do, I would, I would recommend personally, um, maybe don't go over a hundred. Now there are some other settings out there that you can start messing with, but for now, if you're a beginner, don't dive into the deep end, keep it real simple, get your prints working and reliable, then go later. Once you're really, <clears throat> um, once you're really proficient with your printer, you understand all the settings, you understand the differences, then you can start messing with those, trying to dial in speeds. You can you can tune some of these to get faster prints and whatnot, but um, I like the the reliability myself, so I, I just kind of leave things. Uh, yeah, please, Julian, if you have a link to the Discord, feel free to post it. Um, so that's sort of like the beginning. When you start your first layers, these are all the settings uh, relevant to your first layers. Um, the normal layers, that's everything beyond that. So you might have 2000 layers in a print. These burning layers, we're only talking about the first six to 11 in this case. Um, yeah, there we go. If you guys, um, need help with lychee, um, you can definitely, Hey, what's up? Um, you could definitely go to their link 
like I said, their support is amazing. If, if anything, like, even if you don't use some of the advanced features, um, for Leechy Pro, I would still support their team. They do an amazing job. Uh, so let's talk about these normal layers. Some more, um, yes. So, um, I'm going to, I'm working on names guys. I'm sorry. Mr. Fit. Oh, okay. Mr. Fister. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think, I think there's always going to be people who prefer, um, one slicer over another. <laughs> and, uh, and that's okay. Like, it's okay for you to, you know, like some people like Ford, some people like Chevy, like it's okay to have your preference. I'm not saying that Chi two box is a bad slicer. It is the slicer I used to use and lychee is the slicer I now use. Um, they, they they might have their pros and cons. Um, so when it, when it comes to which slicer do you use when changing those lift speeds, I think the end result is the same. So it doesn't matter which slicer you're making those adjustments with, I believe. Um, because the printer is doing the same thing regardless of what the slicer said. So if in Chi2 you set the lift speed to 120 millimeters a minute, it doesn't matter that you did it in Chi2. The printer itself does exactly what it's told by the slicer. So by all means, you're welcome to check out Chi2 Box. Um, just not just not my personal cup of tea, but uh, go well until okay. So Bambridge says. How do you deal with the ugly bottom side? I find my prints go well until the bottom nearest to the plate, then look a bit sloppy. Um, that's one of those things I, I'm, I'm mostly like, I'd have to see pictures. I'd have to, I'd have to sort of get a sense for what you mean. Um, we can touch on some of the things that, um, that might be specific in detail, uh, but that could be more of an advanced, like understanding about what's taking place. Uh, we should also, um, Carrie, if you're still watching or anybody from our discord, actually, you know, what? I'll just, I'll take care of it real quick. I was going to ask for a discord link. If you have some, some questions or you want to, um, maybe post specific examples of, of things that you mean. Sure. Okay. Um, Bambridge jump on our discord. This is the table flip foundry discord. And, uh, and you can post some pictures in our resin printing, uh, chat. And after class, I can have a look at them for you and I can, I can get a feeling cause there could be a few reasons why that could happen. And rather than speculate, um, I'd rather take a look and then I can help you sort of dial that in. Um, but we can definitely, we can definitely, um, address that. So anybody who's in chat, if you guys aren't, aren't already, you should have a, head over to our Discord. We've got a super friendly community. Um, if you are the type of person who just likes to talk to other people who like the same thing that you like, we got you. If you are struggling with printing and you need help, we got you. If you want to learn how to paint, we got you. If you want to teach us how to paint, we're here to listen. If you just did an amazing print and you just want to brag about it and have some people tell you how amazing it is, we got you. We got places for that too. So, um, Please, if you're if you're interested at all, you ever want help, we've got a great community. Feel free to join. Uh, let's get back into some of these these settings. So, normal layers are the ones that are the most like we'll say most important part of our. I think it's very hard to help. Absolutely, yep. Uh, HMB Doc says, "Is it okay to post looking for help with other people's models? We actually don't produce any models at all, so everything is other people's models. So any help you need whatsoever, it doesn't matter if it's somebody we work with, somebody we don't work with. Um, our community is for the community; it's not uh, necessarily for any particular artist. So we do have a lot of artists there. So if you." need something done or you want to see something new or you're looking for a certain model or a certain type or you have requests like you can definitely answer those or ask those questions but anybody any any model anytime anywhere bring it over and we'll we'll all do our best to see if we can help you out um, okay so normal layers 95% of our print is done with normal layers not with burn-in layers and so this normal layer is 
uh, these settings are super, super important for your level of detail in your model. So layer thickness is the first one. This is, you know, when the build plate comes down and then creates that little gap between the FEP and the and the build plate, and that's that layer that the resin is curing in. That's what this layer thickness is. So the the bigger the layer, the more noticeable it's going to be. So when we're talking about high detail, we want a small the smallest layers we can get. So that comes, there's pros and cons to having really fine layers. So with really fine layers, you get more detail, right? Which is a plus, but you get longer print times, which is a minus. Also, the lower the detail, the more time your screen is, is being hit by UV light. So if you print everything at a really fine detail, you're going to get less um, prints for your screen life, but the prints that you are getting are going to be very nice and highly detailed. I'd say the average, like most people are comfortable at 50 microns. So that's what this UM is. You might also recognize this at 0 0.05 millimeters. If you come from FDM printing, this is probably going to be a more familiar number to you. So a regular FDM printer will print in point one or 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters, usually 0.2. Resin printers print far, far, far finer detail than that. Um, so for basic stuff, even for myself, I print at 50 microns. For work on our Etsy store for my customers, I print at 25. Um, I try to provide the best quality product I can to our customers. So for today, we'll just talk about, we'll talk about this 50 micron. This light off delay is the same as the other side. It's just how long is that light turned off between layers? I, I like to keep that screen alive as long as possible. I don't crank that up or down in this case. Um, I'll get, I give the time, to, the screen some time to cool down. Exposure time, arguably the most important setting you can, you can set on your printer. If this exposure time is wrong, your print will look really mushy or it will not print at all. So this setting is the quickest way to ruin a print. Um, so we, we need to do everything we can to ensure our exposure time is as close um, to correct as possible. In this case, in my conditions with my printer, 2.8 seconds for a 50 micron layer. It's just chef's kiss. Um, the lift distance, <clears throat> um, Oh, there's another question. Bearded said, is there a way to make that heat work for you in the house that goes down to six? Oh, the heat already is encased inside your printer. Um, so unfortunately, no. Um, there are methods for controlling the temperature inside your printer. I personally built a room inside my basement and all of my printers go in that room and I keep that room temperature controlled. A lot of people will make a like an enclosure and then they'll just monitor the temperature inside the enclosure um let's let's talk about this because this is a really important aspect of uh <laughs> thanks man um this is a really important aspect of, of resin printing is temperature temperature correlates um very much with exposure time so um if your temperature, let's say in I'm in Nebraska and during the day in Nebraska, not today or recently, but during the day, it might be 50 degrees during the day, but at night it'll drop down to five degrees. We have occasionally very wide ranges of temperature. Well, I do have that room, but I do have an exhaust fan in that room that leads outside. And uh, I had to do the same thing, Colin. Um, and so because I have an exhaust fan in that room, I get some cold air that comes in and red. That's, um, that's something I just learned about. Let's, we'll talk about that here in a second. So that room can drop 10 degrees in temperature, even with a heater going. So let's discuss like, what is, what is temperature's relationship with resin and how does that work? When we're curing 
into an opaque resin, a resin that you can't see through. That light can only penetrate that resin through the pigment so far. Um, so the thicker the resin or the heavier the pigment, the less light penetration we're going to have. And we may not be able to expose the layer height that we've asked for um, quite so well with a thicker resin. So you'll notice a lot of the 4K resins and probably now the 8K resins are getting thinner and thinner. And that's because those those when, when the resin is cold, those molecules sort of tighten up and get closer together and penetrating light through that can get harder. So there's like a sweet spot, like we don't want it super hot um, and we don't want it super cold. So there's a sweet spot. I find that 70 degrees, uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit is like the sweet spot. If I can get my room in there, then I know my settings are good for that temperature and we're good to go. But what will happen is if, if it gets really cold outside or it's super windy and the wind's blowing into my, my exhaust fan, the, the temperature can drop from, let's say, normally mine 77 down to like 67. When I wake up the next morning, my prints will have failed. And that's because the resin cooled over the night and got thicker. And because the, the, resin changed my exposure time needed to change but it was in the middle of printing it doesn't adjust its own time in the middle of prints and so it probably would start out like perfectly fine and, and as the temperature dropped you would start to see failures within the print so it is very important that that we keep a regulated temperature in the room if that temperature is 68 degrees, that's totally okay. You can make that work. It just means your exposure times are going to be a little higher in order to compensate for the difference in the thickness of your resin due to the temperature. So there are ways that everybody gets around it. And Red Hookah just said, like, one that I've just learned about. I haven't tried it myself, but it's genius. Um, there's something called a brewer's belt, which is like a... Um, a silicone belt you can wrap around your vat and it is a heater i guess for brewing alcohol and uh and you can hook that up so that it maintains a certain temperature in your vat so that the reg the resin itself is um is uh is set at a specific heat no matter what happens in the environment so Colin just said, maybe in the future, printers will come with a small heater and a thermostat as an option. There is Elegoo actually created one at one point. I believe it was Elegoo, um, but they never that you can't find them anymore. There is a DIY and we can see if I could find it. They had it on Thingiverse. There is a DIY system you can you can buy um, resin heater um, that you can build yourself. And I started one. Uh, I just never finished it because I changed my room. So you can actually build this little heater yourself and put it inside of your your um, build area, inside of your printer. And this has a thermostat and, a, and it will turn on um, one of the members of the TFF Discord wrote a guide. Oh, heck yeah. If we have that, let's let's see if we can we can get people seeing that but i've built one of these and what it does is it monitors the temperature inside the vat or inside the build the build housing of the printer and it will sort of keep it within a certain range so you set it to 74 degrees it's going to keep it somewhere close to 74. um so i don't know of a company selling one of these um but it's very cheap to build you can get these parts on amazon just absolutely dirt cheap i think less than 30 bucks um and there's a few different designs for it out there. So, um, so you can build an enclosure. You can put your, you can put your printer in a cabinet and then put a heater in the cabinet. You can build a little room like I did. Uh, monitor the temperature in the room. The the temperature is very very important that we keep it consistent at the very least. So even if it's on the colder side, that's okay. Because when you're printing, you've got it set. You've got your exposure time set for that temperature. But if your temperature changes dramatically in the middle of printing, you're going to find it very difficult to um, to get really consistent prints. Um, so 
I'm not saying use these settings if you have a, a, a frozen 4K. That's that's not what we're getting at here. Um, these settings work for me. My temperature in my room is usually 75 to 77 degrees. I happen to use this exact resin. So um, these settings may not be perfect for you, but it might be a good starting place. And, and then that's sort of like where we can go from. So um, if you keep an eye out on the, on the Twitch, I will announce our new calibration part. We call the cones of calibration um, that we'll be releasing to the, to the community soon. Um, and that will be like a method for dialing in your, your printer to a really good tolerance for printing minis. Um, so that's coming down the road. Okay, cool. So that is the basics of how our 3d printer works, right? We, we understand, you know, there's a light, the light shines uh, through a screen, the screen blocks out certain parts of the light and only lets certain, certain sections through those sections correlate for the, um, they correlate with the certain layer of the model, the settings, um, a great calibration tool that I use. Actually, let me, I'll tell you what I use, but, um, crazy mad scientist has, is, is mid like deep dive into calibration parts. But I personally currently, um, when I'm not using our calibration part, um, the Amerilab city is a really good, um, a really good option. I find that that just was enough. I knew what to look for in that. And, uh, it gave me a pretty good, um, idea of what, where to go. Once we release ours, like I'm not saying we're gonna like make that part irrelevant. I think that part will sort of complement the way ours works. Um, but she might have some other advice. She's printed, I think, everything under the sun recently, and she might be able to um, answer that a little better than I can. Um, all right, great. So that's it. We are, you know, we understand the printer, we understand the resin, we understand temperature, we understand the the importance of exposure time and and lift speeds and stuff like that. So let's talk about actual printing, like what is necessary for actual printing. So let's bring in a model. Let's, let's look at something fun today. Um, there is a a new, it's a newer Patreon. They're only like three or four months old, but they have really, really great models in my opinion. Um, the Patreon is called Red Clay Collectibles. And this month they're putting out uh, a set of, I'm going to use quotes here, of mermaids because they're, there's, they're lacking a better term. They're actually mer octopus. <laughs> Um, so let's bring one of those in. This is a very complex model, so we're not going to dig too deep into it, but we're going to have a quick look at, um, you know, what does a model look like on our build plate? What are our steps to like getting it ready to, um, to print? And then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So here we've got our model the models on the build plate. Can we just hit print? Nope. We absolutely cannot just hit print and go. Um, we have to consider some physics. Right? So when we're looking at our slicer, it's important to remember that our printer does all of this upside down. So it'll take you a little while for your brain to just sort of like process. Everything is, is upside down when we're looking here. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is why can't we just print it directly on the build plate? So we're going to look at it from underneath and we're going to have a, um, a quick look at how does the model stick to the build plate. This is the important part. So in order for a model to print on the build plate, it has to have a portion of itself connected to the build plate. In this case, <coughs> excuse me, the very first layer are these two little spots. So if we were to just hit go, we would expect this whole model to be held up by those two little spots. And that's just not possible, right? It would break off almost immediately. So, so those spots are connected to the build plate. They will print just fine. As we go up layers, we notice that the next layer is connected to that first layer. We go up again. That one is connected. Oh, now we have a problem, right? these layers all connected to the build plate. So they printed this layer was sort of floating in the air, 
right? There's no way that it can print because it has no connection at all to the build plate. So we refer to these little areas here as islands. They look like little islands in a sea of gray. Anytime we see an island like that, we have to connect that island to the build plate in some way. And we do that using supports. Um, I'm going to, for this, for the sake of doing this, understandably, we're going to swap this up a little bit. Here we go. Um, okay, so now we have some islands. We need to add some supports to those islands. So what happens here is we have now connected those islands through the support to the build plate. So now we know those islands are going to print. Everything on this 3D model from top to bottom in some way needs to go back down to the build plate. So if I were to say support this, this tentacle, well, the bottom of the tentacle, th this is very bad. So we're not, we're not getting into the details of supporting, but the bottom of this tentacle is connected to the build plate. The top of this tentacle is connected to the bottom of the tentacle is connected to the build plate. So the top is connected too. But we'll also notice that there's an island here for the top. This island won't print. So we need to make sure we add supports to the island. So now this island is connected to the build plate. This tentacle is connected to the build plate. And as it starts to grow, they connect to each other. And now both are connected to the build plate. So this is like, like one of the foundations for getting a print to work properly is that we have to understand that all parts of the model in some way have to track back down to the build plate. Now there are parts that I missed, like these little tentacle pieces. I didn't put supports on them. So there's, see all these little islands? Those little islands also need supports. Now those islands are connected to the build plate. And as we start to go up, as we start to go up in our layers, you'll notice that they connect to the tentacle now they're connected to the tentacle. The tentacle is connected to the build plate. Everything's good. <clears throat> so as we get into um, understanding how to prep our model for printing, we just need to understand that, again, all parts of the model fall back to the build plate. So we're not going to take a look at that model. That's a very, very complex, intricate model. Let's take a look at something a little easier. We're going to start with just a cube. And we want to print this cube um, for whatever, for science. And so the first thing we look at is, can we print this right on the build plate? Yes, we can. Do we want to? No, we absolutely do not want to. The reason we don't want to print this on the build plate is because this contact with the build plate is going to be very difficult to remove. And with no way to get a spatula underneath it to pry it off, um, it's it, we could potentially break this cube trying to remove it. The other part of that is if you guys remember, we have a um, the first six layers are being cured almost 10 times longer than the remaining layers. Well, when we expose that resin to UV light so long, it will expand like ice cubes and it will get fatter. So we'll get a little area around the bottom that sort of sticks out. We refer to this as elephant's foot. So, you know, elephant's feet get all mushed on the bottom, right? So the bottom of this will mush out and it'll no longer be a cube. It'll be mostly a cube with this elephant's foot on the bottom. So what we want to do in order to print this cube more accurately and remove it more comfortably is we want to lift this off of the build plate and use supports to hold it up. So there's a couple ways we can do that. Um, when we talk about the, the auto support um, workflow, um, we're going to get into like how to do this front to back. Like this is the first thing I click. This is the second thing I click. For now, we're just going to do it this way for understanding. So in Lychee, there's a utilities button right here. That utilities button has the ability to lift the object off the build plate. First things first, we got to get that often that object floating in the air. Um, 
Okay, so that's what we've done. We're great. Let's have a look at the first layer. First layer is going to be, here we are, first layer. Okay, so we know that this first layer has to connect to the build plate in order for it to print. It can't just float in the air magically. So here we go. I put a support on this layer. We're good to go, right? So no, technically the whole layer is connected here, but of course there's no way that this one pillar, it's, it's sort of like a building. There's no way a whole building can be held up by one post. We would need to hold the building up by multiple posts or pillars. So here we are, we've got some, we've got some supports on the bottom of this. Um, but what we have to start thinking about is whether or not these pillars can overcome um, for there, there's two terms I'm going to use the weight of this or can overcome the suction of this. Remember when everything happens upside down, the build plate pulls this off the FEP and when it pulls it off the FEP sheet, it creates suction. So we need to determine whether or not these supports are strong enough to overcome the suction of the build plate pulling this off the FEP. I can tell you through experience, there is no way that will take place here. Knowing that, can we make this print? Sure, we can. We can make this plant print by just adding a ton of supports around the bottom until it does overcome the suction. But this is not optimal. There are much better ways we can do this. Also, every support we place on the, the model is going to be a teeny amount of damage to that model. And we want to limit the amount of damage we, we make. So the way we handle this is by changing the orientation of the cube so that we have less suction forces applying to the supports. So let's say we take the cube and we just turn it on one axis. Now let's have a look at it. Here's the first layer. Well, this is a big, big, big difference, right? Like we have way less suction forces happening on that first layer now. So we can place supports down this first layer, just like this. And now we're, now we're talking, right? That's way less to, to handle, but we do need to consider as the part builds and builds and builds each layer is more and more and more suction force. Can these supports hold up this suction force as the, as the part starts to build? I can tell you through experience, no, they cannot. There's also other elements involved. Um, remember that the, the part will always pull perfectly straight up, but with these supports off center, the part is going to tilt as it pulls up and that tilt can make these fail as well. So while this is better than the first orientation, this is also not the optimal orientation for us, but we do know that we're getting a lot closer. All of this is connected to the build plate the way it's supposed to be. So let's have a look another way. Another way we can mitigate some of the, the suction force at the beginning is by, by tilting in two axes. Now let's have a look at our first layer. Look at that. Look how small that first layer is. Will this one support hold up the first layers of this of this cube? Like, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to call you CJ. <laughs> CJ, um, I'll, I can go into some of the settings, like the pillar settings. Once we start digging into... Um, once we start digging into a little, we're going to do a little bit about supports, but you can, um, let me create one like this. You can right click it and then you can make it a support pillar and it will come perfectly flat. So we went from having a cube that needed 30 supports to support the first layer to orienting that cube to where it only needs one support to support the first layer. All right, now we're on the right track. But we know that one support won't overcome this amount of suction force. So we, we know that this isn't perfect, um, but we're off to a good start. So what do we need in order to overcome a wide suction force like that? Well, we just need more 
supports. So it needs more pillars. And the way I would do that is instead of placing supports along the side of the cube, I know that when you break these off, there's going to be a little teeny mark in the cube. And let's say I want to keep a really nice surface of the cube. Oh, Christopher. All right. I'll try to remember. Um, what we can do is we can place supports along these edges here. Every couple of millimeters. And then here's our trick. The keystroke for this, I believe, is Alt-P. And that will make them perfectly straight. And then what I'll do is I'll go up these edges. And I'll go up these edges. So why am I putting the supports on? Oops, that one's not very good. On the corner here. So the way I look at this is no matter where you put a support, inevitably, there is going to be some sort of damage to the model when when the um when the support is taken off the model there would be some level of contact that's breaking um i do have a little one hookah um i can't demonstrate it on this model but i'll show you on another one here in a minute um so knowing that there's going to be some level of damage what i'm doing here by placing this this point on the edge is i'm 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 sort of like using the idea that no matter, typically, I, I want to say no matter what, but it's not no matter what, but typically you're going to see this edge from only one side for the most part. And by placing these supports on that edge, I'm only going to see half the damage. I'll never see all of the damage unless I'm really dead on looking at it. And so by placing supports inside creases or along edges, you can sort of minimize the amount of visibility of the damage by sort of hiding it visually. Um, it's not a perfect science. There, you know, there's always a pro and con. Um, and, and these are just things you'll want to consider. Um, but in this case, I know that this nice big surface of the cube is going to have a perfect finish on every side. So here we're looking at, at the cube and we've just have these three rows. Do we think that this will print? I think that would print, you know, um, I think this would probably print. The only thing we'd have to consider is are the tips of these supports big enough to hold up the weight, the, the bigger, the contact. So let's have a quick look at that. The bigger, the contact tip the more it can hold, right? And all of these are very light contacts. My light tips are 0.22s. Um, so this, this portion of supports um, are very technical and these aren't, this is not something I'm gonna dive, deep dive into right now. You just have to know there is a correlation between the size of this contact and how much weight the support is holding up. Um, the way this auto support method I'm going to be teaching today, um, is designed, it keeps that in mind when choosing where to place supports. And that's super important and no other auto support system does this yet. So, all right. So we know how the printer works. We know how resin works. We understand the importance of exposure time. We now understand, and hopefully this answered the question earlier about like the, um, the bottom layers like being um like overexposing the model so we know that uh that by lifting the model off the build plate we can have a much better print and then or how important the orientation of the model is um to its printability so um let me answer hookah's question here real quick let me bring in a model that's a little more complex um, we recently started doing some work for a company called Infinite Dimensions, and they sent us some furniture. And some of these things are 
um, are like a perfect a perfect way to to get an idea for measuring. So here's an altar um, for a church by infinite dimensions, and um, and we're gonna take a look at the bottom. So you see how this checkerboard pattern showed up on the bottom, hookah. We can use this checkerboard pattern to measure um, to measure placement. Eventually. Uh, you do enough of this, you don't need the checkerboard pattern anymore. Like you just have it in your head. Um, but when you're first starting, you can understand, and I believe, I believe this is accurate, is that each one of these checkerboards are two millimeters apart. So the way that I know that is I'll place this support on the corner, and I know that my support, the trunk diameter of my support is one millimeter. And I've got a gap between the two. So here between this one and this one, I have about a millimeter gap. And each one of these is a millimeter. So this is a method you could use for measuring support distances between each other. However, I don't know if they've implemented it yet. I haven't looked into it uh, personally, but I know Lychee is implementing or has implemented a way to measure um one support distance away from the last support you placed and i have to look into that i haven't i personally haven't messed with that too much yet but it is something i know that they're they're implementing there's like a little ruler somewhere where you can see how far away the last support you placed was uh, but this is a cool little trick for for measuring and while we're here is this the proper orientation um for this altar right it it's not quite we want to take and tilt it on a second axis so that we've got one point down at the bottom um great okay so we've got a basic idea like what are supports how do they work why do they work where do we place them let's talk about the uh you know the table this what i'm calling the table flip and for for lack of better terminology it's semi-auto this is a workflow that you have to go through in order to um, to place these supports, but it's a, it's like step by steps how to do it. Um, so before we get started, we need to understand a few things that are just specifically important to supports. And um, and then like a couple of little bitty reminders. Uh, yeah, Nick, um, absolutely, I have some tips. Let me run over those tips for Nick real quick. Support diameter, exposure time <clears throat> are the two main characteristics of, of, of whether or not a support comes off, works, doesn't work, comes off easy, causes a lot of damage. So... When it comes to settings for your printer, I can't get into those details. I'm not there with you in the environment or anything like that. Here's the thing, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it on, on this model. If I am going to place a support on the model, um, yes, the, uh, Doc Waltz, that's a, that's a great tip. Heat will help you remove those supports. But if you're having a hard time, I don't I don't ever use heat to remo remove my supports. I never need it, right? So if you have to use warm water, something went wrong along the way. But warm water is a great, a great heat in general. I used to have a heat gun handy where I could just warm them up a little bit and break them easier. It's a great way to overcome like something that you can't undo now. But here's the thing. Some people, when they play supports understand that we want this thing to print more often okay and what they'll do is instead and in, when they make these support tips they'll make them very large and the larger they are the more likely they are to work and there so there's a problem with that if i do this whole model with all these super fat supports all the way around and i've heard of people using even like the default I don't remember the defaults for Lychee. The defaults for Lychee are very big. So some of these supports are even bigger. Like this. 
this support at 0.6 millimeters is going to require yeah so we my advice we're not going to do that um we're going to set our settings down a little lower but we'll have to cut this off with with cutters or we'll have to break it off and when we break this off it's definitely going to leave a mark so here's a general idea for you now the math on this is not perfect but it's close enough that it will make sense if i have a support that is 0.6 millimeters and it's holding up this this circle i could do that and i could have a nice big 0.6 millimeter divot and i'd have to break it off but why wouldn't i use 2.28s or 3.28s three of these provide more contact to the model oh excuse me more contact to the model with less damage right so i'm providing more support by placing three but each of these three supports comes off without damaging the model no need for water hot water no need for heat and i've provided my model more support now this comes at a cost the cost is a little more resin but it's marginal you know uh, one one support is not very much resin and and my end goal is the quality of the model, right? It's not necessarily to save myself as much resin as I can. And so if you want to save resin, go with the bigger support. If you want a better quality and easier product comes off the supports very easily. We need to, we need to understand the correlation between the diameter of the tip of that support um, and how much it's actually holding up. I could, place four supports here like this there needs to be one in the middle but ignore that for now <clears throat> so yes that's more contact surface on the build plate that's more contact surface on the model but because i've divided that contact surface across an area of the model it's easier to remove it holds up more and it damages the model less all at the expense of more resin but i'm okay with that expense you know so if you are supporting your own models and, and you're having a hard time like breaking these model these supports off, we need to adjust your your um your settings. That said, let me share something with you guys. And I'm going to let me here we go. Here are my settings for um for Lychee Pro. So my, my light settings, I use a 0.9 diameter on the support. So that diameter is, is here. See how thick the diameter, I call this the trunk. <clears throat> so I use a 0.9 on light. <laughs> Next, just hit. Um, I use a 0.22. So here's the thing with the lights the light the size of the light support is the one that i adjust the most i adjust this based on my needs and we won't get into those needs right now we just want kind of like a a light overview right but 0.22 is a really good light diameter tip just remember if it's failing you either need more of them or you can go up to a medium so the diameter is 0.9. The tip, di uh, the tip diameter is the part that touches the model is 0.22. I leave all of my tip lengths 2.0 and I adjust them if I need it. My medium is one, one millimeter with 0.28 tip diameters. The reason I have a difference between the, the trunk diameter of each support is, is not because they do a better or worse job. But here, let me demonstrate. I can, without looking, tell which size support it is just by looking at the size of the trunk. So when I have a full model fully supported, I can tell which, which uh, support is being used just by looking at it 
Whereas if they all had the same trunk size, you would have to click it and then look at the setting. So here I'm looking at the bottom. I can tell this one's a heavy, this one's a medium just by looking. So I keep those different trunk sizes because I can identify the support size real quick. If I don't have that, right, I wouldn't be able to tell if this was a heavy, if this was a light, if this was a, a medium, I would have to click it and then look up here to see the tip diameter. And I'd have to click this and look up here to see the tip diameter. But with that fatter, <coughs> with that fatter trunk, sorry, <clears throat> with that fatter trunk, I can tell right away. So that's why I have the different, um, the different diameters there. Um, so 0.28 is my medium size. Medium is far and away the most common support that I use. I probably use 2% heavy, maybe 10% light, and the rest of them are mediums. So this is my bread and butter right here. The heavies should only be used in places that can't be seen easily or in, or in places where the damage of the support coming off wouldn't be noticed, like on a texture or, or something like that. And they should only be used to anchor your model to the build plate. This part of, of, the, of learning supports is very important, especially for our auto support system. We need to know that in order to hold that model to the build plate, we need a heavy contact on the model holding it in place. All the rest of the supports are to keep the detail, but the anchor supports are to keep it stuck to the build plate. So I might only place a few of these 0 0.40 millimeter supports on the build or on the model, but those supports are placed in a way that is, is super important for the success of the print. So take a screenshot. Um, maybe I can, uh, I don't think this will work, but I'll post this here. Uh, I'm familiar with 3d printing pro. I have not. Um, that's, that's sort of like, he does the same thing I do. I'm actually, Greg and I are, are friendly. Um, we talk every now and again. Um, I have not looked at his support settings. Um, not since I was very new at this. In fact, Greg has been around doing this a long time. He is extraordinarily knowledgeable when it comes to th the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, I have possibly a different idea about how to go about that. Does that make his wrong and mine right? No, absolutely not. There are many ways to approach this. I just have not... Um, Mr. Not nearly as much as the tip diameter. It can, but not nearly as much. Um, but no, so I haven't compared Bearded to to his support tips. Um, I have compare, uh, compared to one of my competitors. Um, I choose a completely different method than they choose. Um, Virish, Virish, oh man, I suck at these names, I'm sorry. Um, Virish Natha. Maybe I pronounced that right. I'm, hopefully. Um, I mean, I, I can't. You can download it if you'd like. I just posted a link to it. You can download the image. Um, the whole video will be up on YouTube. So you'll be able to check it out on our YouTube channel, which just look up Table Flip Foundry. Um, so this will be available to you. You can also join our Discord. And I think I have it posted in our Discord as well. Let me grab you guys a link. We'll post it again here. Um, I don't want to get off too too far off topic here. Here's our discord. You're welcome to join any questions. I'm there. Crazy mad scientist is there. A um, lot of like super helpful people are over there. So if you have any future questions, any more specific questions that I can't get to right now, ask away, you can be posting them right now and you'll be getting answers right now. Um, so keep a screenshot of this, take some notes, whatever you need to do. Um, click the image, join us on our discord. Um, so Nick, uh, Nick is cool said, I have used them and this is in regards to 3d printing pros settings, but I was getting very inconsistent success, probably more so because I was using pre-supported models and not knowing. Yeah. So here's the thing. Um, this model is a model I pre-supported for an artist called Velrock art. 
this model prints perfectly for me. I test print everything that goes out. You may get this model and it may not print perfectly for you. And that's going to have a lot to do with your exposure. If you choose, let's say you have my exact setup, my exact temperature, my exact printer. If you choose an exposure time of 2.4 instead of 2.8, there is a where, uh, where, how do you, upon reading this whole message, please head over to roll request. And oh, um, ignore that for now. I, I'm still a new, like a new Discord admin. <laughs> um, so ignore the role request um, section. I think that was in the rules. So please ignore that. I'm so sorry about that. I will spend some time this week getting it dialed in. Um, okay, so if you have a lower exposure time, there is a high likelihood that this model won't print for you. What's happening with the lower exposure time is that the tips of these supports are getting smaller and smaller because the exposure time is getting lower and lower. And all of a sudden, supports that are working for me at 2.8 aren't working for you at 2.4. This is, and I'll go off on, a, on an hour-long tangent, and I'll try not to in this stream. Uh, we can talk about this on the Discord. This is, in my opinion, one of the hardest parts about being a member of the 3D printing community is that we don't all have the same exposure settings, right? I'm not talking about the same exposure time. I'm talking about the same exposure outcome. So that's that's one of the things that make learning this the hardest is knowing how much exposure will get you the result we're looking for. We aim to fix that, right? Like my team at Table Flip Foundry, uh, Crazy Mad Scientist has been like my um, my lieutenant in the fight towards figuring out how do we get everybody to understand exposure, understand calibration, where we're working really hard to make it much easier for you so that these types of things are more consistent. So I know that 3D Printing Pro has some very light, a very light touch when it comes to his support settings. And I love that, but it requires you to have a higher exposure. And I don't love that. So everything's give and take. <clears throat> what I've shot for is the middle, like a really good exposure with really good detail and a really good middle ground for, for tips. Red Hookah, join the Discord if you haven't already. And you... I think within the next couple of days are going to be introduced to something that solves that exact problem. Maybe, you know what? Maybe I'll showcase, maybe I'll show, I'm going to showcase that now. We haven't announced it officially, but I am, uh, <laughs> did you, I, I, unfortunately I'm, I've got discord closed or else I'll get distracted. Okay, so bear with me. You guys are going to be, aside from our test printing crew and a couple of choice friends, you guys are going to be the first people to see this. And um, we're still finalizing everything. We want to make sure that it's that it's working perfectly before we announce it. But I'm so glad Hookah uh, mentioned this. This is one of the key factors in calibration in, in current... Um, in our current environment that I think is the hardest is understanding what we're looking at when we print one of the current calibration models. So, um, so when we're, when we're talking about calibration, right. Or exposure, we have two different we're, we ha we're, we're using the same term for two different things. And it's really important that we start to learn that there are two, um, there are two things we're talking about when it comes to exposure. One is how long was the light on? We often refer to this as exposure, right? But if we continue to refer to it as exposure, we're, we're not understanding what the end result is, right? So when Mr. says, I use a 1.7 exposure, he doesn't mean he, he, he's not, he's not doing a 1.7 exposure. He's doing a 1.7 light on time. And what that's doing is that's causing a certain amount of exposure. So this is the weird part, right? It's, 
his light was on 1.7 seconds, but his room was at 68 degrees. My light was on 1.7 seconds. My room was at 75 degrees. Our exposure is different. Mine is higher than his. And so by using the term exposure to reference how long our light is on, we have a hard time now communicating to each other that, that we have the same outcome. Because I can go, yeah, I have a mono X, I use 1.7 seconds. What do you have? You say, I have a mono X, I use 1.7 seconds. And we forget to mention our temperatures. We have different exposures. We just have the same amount of time our light is on. So what we need to do as a community is come together and understand that there is a perfect exposure. That perfect exposure is impossible to achieve, but we can get very close. All we need to understand about exposure is coming as close as we can to the part we're printing being accurate dimensionally. If we're printing a cube and that cube is, uh, let's look at the scale, is 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. If we overexpose this cube, it's going to be slightly bigger than 10 millimeters. That is not the right exposure. If we underexpose this cube, it's going to be smaller than 10 millimeters. That is not the right exposure. Now, the time that our light is on is going to change for everybody. We all have different variables in our in our printing experience. The end result of those calibrations needs to be this part that is 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters actually being printed at that size. And this is the thing I think a lot of people either don't understand, haven't learned yet, or haven't considered is that the um, all anybody talks about is how long is your light on? What's your settings? What we don't talk about is what's your result? Your result needs to be as close to accurate as possible. So what we are doing is we have designed a part that helps with calibration. Oh, guys, I'm kind of nervous. I'm about to show you something almost nobody's seen. Um, with the express idea that it tells you without a shadow of a doubt whether whether or not you have the right result, not the right settings, but the right result. So here's what we have. I want to introduce you guys to the cones of calibration by Table Flip Foundry. So this is, let me grab the the revised part here. This is a new method of calibration that we have been testing for months that very specifically addresses the idea that your end result is the same as everybody else's. Have you guys ever seen, um, let me see if I can, I can find one here. Have you guys ever seen a post like this? So this says, I'm not very good at reading these SPS doodads. This is a nine point seconds on a blah, 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 right? Do I need to increase exposure? So we look at this, right? And then somebody responds and says, yes, you need to. I have too. I have made these posts too. So here was what, here was what really got, here's another one. Here's one with the Amerilabs. Still messing around, making sure my exposure is all right. Can I get your thoughts? Guys, let me let me say that there's no perfect. That even this, with as much testing as we've done, is not perfect. But I put forth to you that if you have to ask after you've printed an expo like a calibration part, whether or not you're calibrated, it is not a good calibration part. You should not be confused at the end and need other people's opinions about whether or not your result is correct. I don't think that's the best way to go about it. So with that idea in mind, we designed this uh, and we and we lovingly call it the cubes of calibration. So the idea behind this is we are using your printer and we're using its f f the cones. What did I say? The cones of calibration. Hopefully I said that. Um, 
We're using your printer and the things we... Thank you so much, Nex. Cones. Um, we're using your printer to determine... Uh, oh my goodness, yes. Yeah, it, Chris, Christopher, if if your room is 90 degrees, you need an air conditioner in your room <laughs> in order to print. Um, or you're really going to lower your exposure time. So the idea behind this is that we can predictably cause your printer to fail and succeed in the exact way we want it to. Okay. So we, we can make a support tip that's so small that we know for a fact it will fail. And if it doesn't fail, your exposure is too high. And we can make a support tip that's so big that it's guaranteed to succeed. And if it doesn't succeed, your ex your um, uh, exposure is too low. So let me give you an example of what that looks like. Here is the cones of calibration with the success side. Our intent is for all of these cones to print, most specifically this cone on the left. If this cone on the left prints properly, then we know our, our exposure is high enough for now, okay? Here's another picture. This picture is a little lower quality. Here on our failure side, we have cones that didn't print. We don't want them to. We specifically designed them to fail. But we have success on one side, and we specifically requested that, that success. And we have failure on this side. We specifically requested this failure. If we are able to accomplish this, we know that our exposure lies within a certain tolerance. If, if I am in Nebraska and it's 50 degrees and Christopher is in Puerto Rico and, and it's 90 degrees, but we get the same results, it doesn't matter what our light on time is. That's not our exposure. It is. It's absolutely self-cleaning. Yep. It's not a, it's, remember, we're not calling our light on time exposure. We're calling our results the exposure. So he is going to have 1.7 seconds and I'm going to have 2.6 seconds, but the end result is identical. Now that we have identical results, we can start talking about which pre-support settings work the best. Okay. So this is a part we're, we're releasing soon. We're on the last bits. We're writing some documentation on it. We're going to make a video of it, but this is the new idea. Um, this is a way we can, we can help the community find the same settings, the same result, so that we can predict what will work and what won't. 90 degrees. Oh, my goodness, man. Oh, yeah, man. I, guys, we, we have had a, I think we have a test team of like 12 people and they have put in so much work. I cannot thank them enough. Um, um, this is, yeah, it should be less than 30 millimeters. I think the, um, it, at 50, at 50 microns, it takes about an hour to print. It is only 15 millimeters tall. Um, so, so in this case, uh, let me, let me pull up our, I have an infographic for you guys and I'm really proud of this infographic and I think you guys will like it. Um, the failure part is self-cleaning Christopher. So it picks up all of the fails and catches it itself and pulls it right off for you. So you don't have to worry about any of that. All right, so this is documentation I wrote the other day. Legends are told of 3D printers with perfect calibration. I'm, I might run over. We still have to. We still have to go over our our auto support method. Um, um, as you enjoy your seat in the table flip tavern, a hooded figure approaches you with without a word, hands you a small object. A moment later, he is gone. Your local artificer identifies this object as the cones of calibration. This is a legendary object, you guys. It adds plus one bonus to all subsequent crafting checks and plus one bonus to saving throws against frustration. This should help you guys not get so frustrated. Um, this is a really important part. This cone right here is what we refer to as our success calibration cone. This cone here is what we refer to as our failure calibration cone. In reality, the rest of these cones are not important 
once you are once you are calibrated. We're really focused on making sure this cone prints and this cone doesn't print. <laughs> um, are they the same along uh, along a side or graduated? Um, these are graduated, so they get larger and larger or smaller and smaller. But our calibration lies between our success and our failure. The reason we have the rest of these cones is so we can, if, if we are not calibrated properly, we can see how far out of calibration we are. So if I go to print and you make sure that you print this part on the center of the build plate, but here's an example. I'm on the failure side of my print and I have a cone and a half that succeeded. We know that these are supposed to fail. So it indicates to us that we are pretty far out of calibration, right? Let's say three or four of them printed. We know we are really far out of calibration. So the rest of these cones are specifically designed to help you identify how far out of whack you are. In this case, one and a half cones-ish, and, and we know that we need to drop our exposure a bit. Now, the amount we drop our exposure is gonna vary printer to printer, right? A non monochromatic printer is going to have a much bigger drop in exposure versus a mono. Same thing applies on the success side. Here we have a success side print where one of our cones didn't print. Absolutely season to season. Um, for, for my mono printers, I adjust things at like 0.2 second or 0.1 second increments. But if you have like the original photon, you're going to be adjusting um, like four second increments or two second increments. So it's, it's different printer to printer, but it gives you a rough idea how far out of whack you are. So here's success with a failed cone. This is the cone we care about. It didn't print, right? So we know that because the success side didn't print that we need to add exposure. Um, so that's all outlined here. Uh, we also add a little errata here to the calibration part. Occasionally you'll see some weird some weird results. Um, it's very hard to indicate like why a result like this might take place. For the most part, they can be ignored because our main focus lies on this cone and this cone. Um, what we've narrowed down recently is this is most likely due to FEP wear. So when, you're, when your FEP stretches and wears out, you can get some, some abnormal results. But even with these results, <clears throat> we know that in this, in this failure part, three of the cones on the failure part printed and it shouldn't. So we know we need to lo lower the exposure. Same with this, right? We know we need to lower exposure. So we can use, we can use our brains, deduce what needs to be, what needs to be done. So if you get a part that looks like this, you have now, <clears throat> yeah, um, that's been addressed next, um, possibly poorly mixed resin. Um, I've got some ideas about pixel alignment and like the center of the cones and all that stuff, but it's not, um, it's like, I don't want people to get really confused by this. You can just ignore result results like this and really focus on the calibration cones to be your, your guide. Um, so if you get success like this and you get failure like this, you achieve a new feat. Your new feat is exposure time mastery. <clears throat> it has no prerequisites. You make this happen and you automatically get this feat. Um, your experience and ability to follow guides has helped you master exposure time settings on your 3D printer. Um, so we're going over some last stuff. Crazy Mad Scientist is doing a write-up for her blog. We're not going to outline in super high detail um, when we release the part. If you want some really technical info, like her blog is a, a, great, a great place to go. Um, Carrie, if you're still on, you should throw a link to your website up. <clears throat> At 2 a.m. I can be extremely dense. I look at this. Look at this bearded boom plus and negative. <laughs> so gotcha. I, I was thinking I was thinking about you when I did that. OK, um, so that aside, I didn't mean to get into that tangent. Uh, but I'm just I'm super glad all you guys showed up and and uh, and just be looking out for that soon. I think. Um, I think we might be able to change some things for the better. Um, this may not fix everything that's happened in the past. This may only help us in the future, but I think this is like your start. Get a good, get good and dialed in here and you're pretty much set. And from there you can go off to 
um, to like try some of the other calibration parts and maybe get a little fine tune in. But this should be like a great starting place for, for anybody, whether you're new or advanced. I've printed tens of thousands of hours across all of my printers. And now this is the part I'm using to calibrate everything that I do. And it's been working great. So I can't wait to share it with you guys. <clears throat> that said, I also want to introduce you guys since we're here. Um, we have a mascot. His name is Puck. <laughs> um, CJ, I would love to do that. Um, but we need to be 100% sure before we start dropping this to the community that we've dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. Um, that I'm not sending you something that hasn't been properly vetted, made sure it's all good. Um, what I'll do though, is if you join the discord server is I will release it to the discord server before we go out to anybody else. <clears throat> uh, no, in this case, you don't need to repeat the calibration all over the bed. Um, this calibration specifically is for exposure time. So when you move this part around your bed, you're going to have different forces from your FEP, like pulling off the bed and it will throw off the actual calibration. So it doesn't matter what size printer you've got, place a sucker in the center of the bed and it's going to get you an exposure time. And that's what we're shooting for. Um, anything beyond that, any troubleshooting beyond that, this part isn't necessarily going to help you like dial in your level. It's not going to do that. Um, your lift speeds, it's probably not going to do that either. But it's going to give you a really good uh, exposure time, I think. Uh, yes, this whole video will be on YouTube later. I'll probably try to chop it up in parts. So the beginning part where I'm talking about the stuff you guys mostly know about, about 3D printers, will um, we'll kind of chop that into its own video. And then in a few moments, I'm going to talk about this auto support workflow that, um, that I developed and that'll probably be its own video too. And then I'll be creating like a very specific video about the calibration part. And then uh, my understanding is, uh, and hopefully this this all works out, this is not 100%, but um, the YouTube channel 3D Printed Tabletop is gonna include this calibration part in a video they've got coming up too. So it should go out to lots of people, we hope. So um, real quick, as part of our release for the calibration to, uh, the calibration, the cones of calibration, um, you are also going to get a free mini. And if you guys, I don't know if you guys have seen him. Hopefully you have, I would think you have at this point, we have a mascot and his name is puck. And this is puck. <clears throat> so this is our little mascot guy. And, uh, Yes, Bearded, I think that is absolutely the idea. I will revise as we get more and more people. Right now we have like a, a test group of maybe 20. And once it's a test group of like a thousand, there might be some things we have to dial in. So it's definitely version 1.0. Um, so this is our, this is our mascot puck. He's just like, um, he's just a little, he's a little guy. He's an adventure. He's got a little temper. And, um, and he's sort of our mascot for Table Flip Foundry. And... Um, we have over the duration of, of like our community had a couple of people decide to do some artwork of puck. So this is another artist. They, they did this for us. Um, and then we also have one from one of our, our members. This is his, his wife. This is Ziomar's wife did this. So this is puck the adventurer and we have available for free for you guys. When you get the calibration part, we have, an official puck miniature that you guys will get. And the way that he is designed is he is also, his pre-supports are calibrated to match the cones of calibration. So you should be able to print the cones of calibration first, get it dialed in and then print puck. And then he should come out perfect and then you're good to go. So, um, so he'll be for free included with the, um, with the calibration part, just as a, a thank you for, um, for liking a part so cool okay that's enough that's enough promo let's talk um auto supports so so auto supports is a weird topic right a lot of us and and let's do let's do an example we're gonna look again at this model from the lions um the lions tower adventure guild which is the it's called the barbarian it's a kickstarter that's coming out here soon um it is a, a sort of like a pinup model, so just be aware. There's 
There's going to be some some thickness coming on here, but um, let's take a look at this. This is um, it's it's sort of a larger model. I'm going to scale her for our purposes down to like 32 millimeters today. Um, we're going to make her like 35 millimeters. So, um, okay. So let's start with the workflow front to back. This is, <clears throat> you know, the table flip semi-auto workflow, auto support workflow. Um, there are some elements to lychee slicer that are really important to understand before getting into this. We recently like discovered a, a feature of the slicer that was confusing us and s some of the support staff at, at Leachy for a while where I had gone in and, <clears throat> and I had done an Island detector on a model and, <clears throat> and I had placed supports on all the islands. And then I sent it out to the client and the client said, Hey, what are all these islands doing here? And I go, no, 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 I did this detector. I placed the support on every single island. There should be zero. He goes, man, there's like 15. And I go, and I took a screenshot of my screen and I sent it to him. I was like, man, I'm not lazy. <laughs> I'm not just skipping these things. I have no idea what's going on. And, and so it was just puzzling. I went to lychee support. Nobody really had an answer. Nobody had experienced it before. And I think that the um the nature of that was was that not a lot of people work in lychee the way that a pre-support worker does most people come in they'll do their their supports for their model they'll print their model they're done it's not really inspected and and passed around unless it's a pre-supported model so then um fast forward a couple months still no answer the same thing arises like <clears throat> Carrie was doing some supports. She got, she nailed all this, all the islands. No problem. I, I bring it over to my computer. I scan it. I've got like 15 islands. And so I send it to her. She's like, no, I, I did all of them. I said, I don't know on my computer. They're not there. And, um, so all credit goes to our buddy Zeomar, who then says something that just opened everything wide up. And he goes, what layer height? Yep. What layer height were you scanning at? So the way it works is Lychee Slicer will scan island detection at this specific layer height that, so that, that layer height had 131 islands. Now that I'm scanning at 25 microns, I should have more. And so as soon as so 106, so we had 31 more islands just by changing our layer height. So as soon as he said that, we went, we ran the tests and we go, oh, you're absolutely right. It was layer height. Like I think Carrie had scanned at 50 and I had scanned at 25. And the same thing had happened when I sent my workout to our customer. He had scanned at 25 and I had scanned at 50. Okay. So this is paramount. This understanding is paramount to, to now creating a workflow that takes island size into account when placing supports. We now can scan these islands based on their size. So I'm going to choose a layer height of 300 microns and do a scan. I only achieved 45 islands. What does that mean about these islands? What that means is that these are our biggest islands and our biggest islands need our biggest support tips, right? So, and from here, it should be like, it should all just come together. All you need to understand is that we know that <clears throat> these 40, 43 islands are our biggest ones. So what I'm going to do, there's a workflow. I'm going to get into the workflow, like step one, step two, step three. But what I would do is not use the auto support function. The auto support function doesn't really care about islands. The island detector has its own auto support placement. It will place supports on as many islands as it can figure out. It won't take into account weight. It won't take into account suction force. It will take nothing into account. 
all it does is it says, there's an island, got to place a support on it. So it places whatever support we have currently selected. So now we have 10 and this is going to be normal. It can't place every, there's like some supports. We just can't quite get a support on our chin, right? Right. So it just doesn't. So here's the semi-auto. We need to go in and add supports that didn't get, that didn't get hit. And this model happens to be very complex. So I'm not going to go through every last detail of this model right now. But the idea is that we just got 90% of the big supports done. And we're going to try to, like, here's a little one, right? We're going to try to go in and maybe catch some of these <clears throat> and add our supports. Uh, Nick says, is it really important to support all islands? I often have some islands on hard to reach places like inside the mouth on the face under the clothes no absolutely not it is not 100 percent necessary to get all islands some islands are very small and if you were not to connect a support to it it would flatten out and be picked up later and it's so small that you would never even see it so it's not necessary to do all of them um when you're doing it professionally, it's it's um, it's necessary because there are plenty of people who will run an island scan after it and be like, hey, there's seven islands on here. Your pre-support company is terrible. People want to complain when they can complain, right? So for me, it's really important we get rid of all of them. Um, for you, though, no, absolutely not. If you think the, the detail is small enough that you're just never going to see it, here's a prime example. See this eyelid right here? <clears throat> When it's fully scaled up, this little teeny eyelid creates an island. You could just ignore it, print it, and you'll never, ever see it. But that's your prerogative. You get that choice when you're when you're supporting something for yourself. <clears throat> this is just going to give us a really great idea of what, what we need to look at. Um, okay, great. So I'm not going to go into these seven islands. Just know that you need to probably go in and, and add like... A manual support because it can't figure that out but let's have a look at the next scan so i scanned at 300 let's scan at 100 let's see how many islands we pick up perfect now we have 59 islands they're all over the place again right but we know that these islands are smaller than the islands before so our tip diameter can be smaller and then we can add we can add all of our supports so let's scan again Cool. We got 44 islands. We know those are smaller. So we're going to make smaller support tips, add some supports. Now you can stop there at 50. I always go down to 25. <clears throat> so I think you guys get the, the, the amazing, powerful part of this feature. Nobody really ever considers this feature. This is just such a little known thing that exists within Lychee. There we go. So we do have 31 supports left. Um, and, and these supports are just places that Leachy couldn't figure out how to place. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. So this, this like workflow, you can tweak it, work it, whatever works best for you. But in, in let's say one, one or two minutes, I was able to place 90% of the supports manually and not only was, or automatically, not only was I able to place them, that would be really fantastic. Matter of fact, it would be really fantastic if their auto support function scanned islands exactly in this way. But for now, you just do it. You know, I have I have a profile set up for a, a resin that I don't use. Um, yes, I'll explain the raft here in a moment. Um, I don't use the default. The default. So I just have arbitrary the the numbers like none of these settings matter at all all that matters is the height because i only use them for scan um bearded i'm not sure the question what layers are you using what search level are you oh okay <clears throat> i always use the real accuracy um in my opinion you should never use anything less than the real accuracy um there are currently 30 islands on this model if I do the fast search, it says there's only one island on this model. 
Does that mean there's only one island? No, there are actually 30 islands on here. So you should always use real. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, so just because it was asked, here's a couple of things to consider. Um, I tend to tilt my models back like this. <clears throat> What layers are you using? What are the mythical layer heights you are using for the scans? Um, okay. These are just arbitrary. They're just the ones that, that I, I hardly ever use this method for myself. Right? Most of my work has to be done by hand, but. Okay. Angelus has a great question. Let me answer this one previous. I use 300, 150, and 25. You can use as many increments as you want. So you can do 300, 250, 200, 150. You can, as many as you want. I use 300, 150, 25. Um, Angelus, Angelus, Angelus. Um, you can still do this. Um, I'll show you. Nick, I'll show you in a second. Uh, Angelus, you can still use this with the non-paywall, uh, non-pro version. I recommend the pro version not only for this feature, you can still do this. Matter of fact, I gave this to a person. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, who happened to be on our Discord server and they were asking some questions. And man, who was that? Oh my goodness. Please find it quickly. Good gorilla. Perfect. Okay. He was asking some questions and I said, hey, actually, since you're new to this, um, do you want to learn this thing and, and give me some feedback and tell me if this is helpful to you? And if you think it's easy to understand and, um, and he said, sure. So I gave him a quick 15 minute rundown on it and this was his next print. So these are from Eldritch Foundry and he used the exact method I'm, I taught here. And these were his prints. They came out great. He does not have the pro version of Lychee. And so he was able to identify enough of the supports to get a couple of good quality prints. So it can be done. If you get better at reading the model. <clears throat> so like, here's a, here, here's two ways you can do it without the super high Island accuracy after you're done and you want to kind of give it a going over. Um, once you're good enough at, at looking at these models, you actually don't really even need the island detector. I can tell you this toe is an island, this toe is an island, this heel is an island, right? There's not an island here, but it needs a support. Island, island, island. I can I can tell which, which parts are just sort of floating in the air, but you could also use this slider. See all of these islands here? I didn't need the detector to find them. I was able to use the slider. So, even if you don't have this real accuracy, you can still give it a once over with the slider and see if you can pick up um, islands just using the slider by hand. So here's an island. Uh, okay, Nick, what's the difference between the auto support function and the island detector function? I will show you. It's hard to say in words, but I will show you. <clears throat> I'm gonna do this on ultra. So we're going to do a, a generate on ultra. So here's our ultra island detector or our ultra auto support. Now we're going to go to our island detector and do a scan. We came up with 30 islands. So even on the highest setting on auto support, there were still 30 islands that were missed. And we're currently at 300 microns. So let's do, let's redo the auto support on ultra. Um, I'm going to answer that question. Let me, let me finish this up. So here we did it on ultra at 25 microns. Let's do an Island detector now at 25 microns. Takes a little longer cause there's more slices. We ended up, after doing an ultra auto support, we ended up with 142 islands. Look at these toes. Auto support missed all of these. 
So can I describe in words the difference between auto support and island detector placement? I can't really, but I think this in and of itself explains it. So in my opinion, auto support is, it tries its best to calculate suction forces, I think, and accommodate for force. Um, but it doesn't necessarily account for printability and islands. And so when I'm doing, oh, the magic wand. Oh, 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 the magic wand is just a one click. It's just a one click function. So this will, um, like I, I always turn these off. Let me, let me reset for you real quick. This is just a macro. So when you, when you click, I'm feeling lucky, it will automatically orient. So it'll rotate this by hand in some way that it thinks is good. It will automatically do so. It'll it'll run auto support like I just did. It'll then optimize the supports. So, so when it does optimize supports, what it means is that it will do it will do a parent on the supports where it will try to combine them, and it will do bracings on the supports. So that's what it refers to as optimizing the supports. Um, so all this does is it just runs a series of different um features all in one click but it doesn't use the island detector see it just braced and parented and organized and tried to orient this this model in a way that it thought was best but now that we've done that let's run this island detector Hundred and thirty-eight islands missed. Um, okay, I gotta do one question at a time. Bearded, I'll get back to that. Um, so let me return my model back to normal. The other the next question is Is it true that three ends of small tips of supports are able to support the same as one gross tip? Yes, that is absolutely true. It is exactly the um, the idea that we use at Table Flip Foundry is that we use more smaller tips to support the same one for that exact reason you stated, because the smaller ones don't leave marks on the model. Priority number one, Table Flip, priority number one, quality of the model. You need to make sure that the end result is the highest quality it can be. By placing large tips, you're degrading priority number one. I, Inferno, I'm so sorry. I do not know. I have not used Lychee in a couple years. I'm sorry, Chi2 in a couple years. And, uh, and I have no idea if they have an island detector. Um, okay, so yes, you're absolutely right. Three smaller tips. Three, if you consider, like you could do the math where you're doing like pi r squared and figuring out the area of the radius and all that stuff. But um, if you consider a 0 0.60 has... 0 0.60 contact diameter and then 3.28s have 84 0.84 contact diameter right 3.28s have more contact with the model than the one big one and three times less damage so it's like i can't i can't think of a single reason why you would do it this way personally right so aside from if you're really, really worried about resin usage, <clears throat> but there's still other ways to like avoid resin usage. You could, you could place your 0.20 and then a couple of little, little branches like this and use a lot less resin, but still have the same contact. So, um, bearded says, is there a way to do what automatically? Um, bearded says, do you use light cheese parenting and bracing? And if so, do you change any of the preferences? Okay. Let's talk about that real quick. I'm getting way deeper than I wanted to, and I'm going to run late, but we're on a roll. Let's do it. Um, let's look, let's look at a, uh, I'm going to try to, I'm just going to pull a simpler model here. That one has so much detail that I want to, um, I want to pull something easier. Okay. 
I turn all of these off. Oh, I forgot to answer the question about the raft. Yes, use a raft. Um, this is the part that will actually be on the build plate. And I use this raft specifically because of this ledge. I can get a spatula underneath that ledge and pry it up really easily. So this is the raft I use right here. If you use the flat raft um, that doesn't have that steeper angle, like the let's say this, for example. I don't know who uses this way. Um, with flexible build pits, you can do whatever you want. If it's easy to get off, it doesn't matter which raft you use. But that's why I use this one. Here's one. Um, this one is based on support placement. So see how this, this raft is perfectly flat? I have a really hard time getting this off a build plate. So I use this one because it's got a nice steep angle I can get under there and just pry it off really easy. Um, I, ha I don't personally use the flexible build plates. Um, I know a lot of people like them. I am skeptical a bit, and what I'm using is working for me just fine. So um, the other aspect is that I have like, I don't know, uh, seven or eight printers, and I don't want to have to buy this build plate for all of them. Um, so I, I sort of like use the lowest common denominator, which is anybody who doesn't have one, and I try to make it as easy for them as possible to remove. So this is the raft that I choose to use. Um, you just use what's best for you, though. Um, this raft doesn't help the model in any way. Um, so, like, if you if you want to use a different raft, it won't affect your model at all. I just use this one for, for the ease. Um, I feel like I missed a question. Uh, let's see. Bearded says, do you use lychee parenting? Oh, parenting and bracing. Let's talk about parenting and bracing. I do use bracing. I do not use parenting. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Okay, we're going to imagine an entire model. Actually, we don't have to imagine. Let's let's grab a model. Let's grab a finished one. <clears throat> I know what I'm looking for. I just cannot find it. Here we go. Let's look at let's look at a dragon. I need to do like a like a my personal workflow. Um, for how I remove my build plates and how I keep myself clean and um, make the least amount of mess possible. I'll have to do a tutorial video on, on YouTube or something. Okay, so let's have a look at, at this model. And, and uh, we, in fact, it looks like I forgot bracing, so this is perfect that we're looking at it. So the parenting option, <clears throat> here is, is sort of my issue with the parent option. <clears throat> excuse me we're using less resin which is really good but the the bracing that's being done so close to the model makes it very difficult even with the medium supports to remove the model from the support tips the problem this is sort of like a, a more a really technical thing but the problem is is when you try to like peel this one up it's braced against the one next to it so you can't just peel this one you have to peel this one and this one but that one is also braced to this third one you have to peel this one this one and this one but those are both braced to this one so you have to peel this one this one all of a sudden we have to pull all the supports off all at once because they're all braced to each other where when they're completely separate this this particular one is flexible and it can pull separate from the rest. And so you can sort of take it and like peel it off the supports very comfortably and easily. Um, it's yeah, it, it also can, um, can trap resin. You can have fusion <clears throat> if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to use parenting, here's the solution I've found is to take your support tips and make them four millimeters long. 
and then parent those and that'll keep the um that'll keep the tangle further away from the model and give you a little extra flex which will help remove the model i don't use this very often but when i do it's with a four millimeter tip so that it, it's separating that bundle from the model a couple millimeters extra and, and just kind of giving you a, a little better um It'll give you nice support. You'll save resin and give you a little easier chance of removing removing them. As far as bracing, um, let let me recalculate here. Okay, on occasion I'll brace the entire model. Most of the time, if it's a normal miniature sized model, I don't. I don't brace at all unless absolutely necessary. Um, Let's look at one I did recently. Okay, so this model is highly complex, but you'll notice that I choose where to brace to use the bracing function, and I choose where not to use the bracing function. Uh, yes. So on this model, and there's an option here in Lychee, is you can do selection heavy. All of these supports that you see highlighted are point four O's. So these are all my anchoring points for the model. And it's the there's a lot more anchors on this one than on a typical model because of the the nature of the nature of the model requires different a different level of of anchoring but um so let's talk about when i use bracing when the support has to go a long way is where i start to use the bracing the bracing option i mostly eyeball this there is no like quantifiable reason i use it but i know that this had to go 20 millimeters unsupported and um and so i want to I was hoping to, uh, here, right. I don't want this thing to just be hanging out there that long. Um, yes, there are benefits. The stability, um, of the shorter one is much stronger than longer. When I have this longer tip, it's thinner for a longer portion of time. And it can, it can, you can have stability issues in certain cases. Um, a case like this one here, right? Th sometimes you have no choice but to use something like this. Um, but the the thinner it is, the longer it is, the the um, less stability it has during printing. So you can get away with these, but that's sort of like a high level, lots of practice, lots of understanding kind of thing. Um, so I, anytime I see a support that's really long like this. This is where I'm, I'm individually using the bracing function to spe like specify places that I think might be troublesome so that I know that these really tall ones are going to support each other and not get all weird and wonky when it prints. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that. Um, are there benefits to shorter law? I answer that. Sometimes I find with the fanning that Lychee wants to start the fanning really far down the support. How does one fix that? Good question. Let's have a look. So uh, here we're gonna we're gonna make a support with fans. The thing you're seeing me doing here, where I can take and edit, this is a paid feature for Lychee. So um, if you don't have paid, ignore that part. Uh, yeah, shift is your is your key to select multiple supports. You hold shift while you select them. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a fan off the bottom of this. I place, I am the one that places where the base of the fan is. So when I click and place the fan down, I choose how far away I want that fan. So sometimes I find when, when fanning the leech, that leeching wants to start the fanning really far down the support. I choose the distance. If I want it far down, I can make it far down. If I want it really shallow, I make it shallow. So that part is up to you. So in order to make a fan, 
you're going to do um, Control and Alt, and then you'll, you'll click the location you want the fan to start and where you want the fan to connect. Your fan is often going to look like this, or your I refer to this as the twig. It's often going to look like this. This will not work. This will not support anything. It's not strong enough to hold itself up, let, enough, let alone hold up this part. So in, in order to fix that, you have to have Lychee Pro. And then you go to base tip and you turn the base tip up to make it fat like that. Now, this is still a stretch, right? This is a really long way for a fat, like a really, I'm sorry, a really skinny support to go. So what I'll do is I'll place multiple supports in a fan like this. Now, what, what we need to like keep in mind here is even though this goes from this base all the way up there, it connects up to these points. They overlap. So now this bundle of fan supports are bracing each other up to the point where they separate. And so this one, which used to be really long, now gets only has to go from this point to this point unsupported. And all of a sudden, we have a really, really strong fan. So <clears throat> um, make sure I got all questions. For bracing, did you use a hotkey? or? Oh, yeah, I answered that. Just hold select to, to select individual, individual supports. And then you can hit bracing. And it'll do weird stuff sometimes. So, like, I do my best. I, wouldn't, I would never use this brace here. I would move the support in some place more appropriate. Or let's say I had to do this, where it's really long like that. I would intentionally place another similar support next to it. Even if I didn't have an island there. Even if this didn't need to be here, but this one needed to be, I would then place another one next to it so that it had a friend to brace itself on. So that's a really good, um, just a really good trick. Um, okay, so... For YouTube purposes, I'm going to go over this workflow from start to finish so that I can kind of cut the video here and just, and just kind of clip it to YouTube without having to, to edit. So let's bring in a model. Um, we're going to bring in one of Velrock Arts models. So here's our model. Um, so I use this magic button, but I only use it because it lifts the support or it lifts the model and adds a raft to it. And that's, those are things I always forget if I don't do this. I tend to tilt my models back. You can orient however you want. From here, we're going to go in and go to our 300 micron layer height. So we need to create a 300 micron layer height, a 100 micron layer height, a 50 micron layer height, and a 25 micron. We're gonna go to 300. The first thing I do with this method, weird enough, is I put auto supports on low, I choose my medium settings, and then I go ahead and let Lychee throw a couple of auto supports down, okay? I, these auto supports are pretty, are pretty, they're good, and they'll help us with support on the model, but it's not everything. After that, I'm going to go to my island detector and, <coughs> excuse me, um, also to note, this first step isn't necessary if you don't want to. If you want to have a little more control over your, your island placement or your uh, support placement, you don't have to do this. I think it works well. So I'm going to do a search at 300 microns. I found 10 islands. So here's what I do. I do, I start at a 0.32 for the biggest islands. I would go in and I would try to find these ones and find a way to add a support to them. This can be hard if you don't have Leechy Pro. Um, but you'll just have to be creative with how you play supports. Okay, so now I've got one more island. It's up under here. I don't know why it wasn't able to place a support. I got one on there. Perfect. So then we're going to switch our scan down to 100 microns. We're going to do another scan. All right, we've got 25 islands to support. These are going to be quite difficult. Okay. Um, I would personally place these by hand, but we can go ahead and let the island detector do them for us. There we go. 
So you notice I I low oh. I lowered my um, my tip diameter down a couple points. Um, maybe you know point two point three. Let's do a point two nine, and then we'll add those supports. All right. So we've got more on here. This is not magic. It's not going to be perfect. Um, it's not going to solve all of your problems. No support method will. This is just going to get you 95% of the way there. Um, so I, I'm just going in and sort of like, you know, loosely making sure I got islands on some of these extras where I think we need them. We definitely need it there. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so there's our second scan. Here's our next scan. Um, a lot of you could just stop at 50 if you want. You don't have to keep going. We're going to stop at 50 today. <clears throat> so here's our next scan. Perfect. We got... Oh, I accidentally hit the wrong button. So we had 17 more islands, but I hit the add support, so it automatically placed. I'm going to undo that because I want to lower my support tip. So we're going to go to 0.26 and then we're going to scan again. All right, we have 17 islands. Let's place our supports. We've got two islands that didn't pick up. Let's have a look. All right, yeah, let's toss those in. I'm going to add two to that one. And here's one of those islands we discussed earlier. You could just leave it. And what will happen is this will sort of flatten out here, but you'd never see it. It's too small of a part. <clears throat> and if it's your own model, totally okay to leave it. In fact, I'm going to. Um, and that's the deepest scan I'm going to do today, right? So I, I isolated the heavier islands and put heavier supports on them. I isolated medium islands, added medium supports on them. And I just incrementally lowered the size of the contact tip based on the island size. So this feature in and of itself is the key to why this is better than just hitting auto support, right? Auto support and no program will take into account what it's supporting, the size of the island it's supporting or the size of the model. The only other thing you want to account for when doing this by hand is to make sure that the bottom of your model has enough anchors. So I might go in and change a couple of these on his feet to heavies. And then maybe an anchor on the on the ball there. I often find capes can be high suction just out of experience. So I might add a couple of supports just um, just because I know that's a difficult area. And I would say there's a very high likelihood that this just gets sent through um, through a printer and comes out great. Um, the removal may not be the easiest because you're gonna have you're gonna have to go in and and individually pull some stuff out. They shouldn't be hard to remove, but it's not just gonna be like a like like a super easy peasy pry pry this off the supports kind of thing. But this should get you in less than five minutes a pretty solid auto support that's better than the auto support function. Takes more items into account, collects most of your islands. Um, and it took you almost no effort or know-how. Just just start at the 0 0.32 and work your way down um, 0.3 every time. So 0 0.32, 0 0.29, 0 0.26, you know, 0 0.2, whatever that is, 2, 2, 2, 3, 0 0.23. Um, and that's it. Auto-supported mini. couple minutes. In order for me to have done this by hand, it would have taken me maybe 40 minutes, half an hour. So we were able to to cut the time down pretty, uh, pretty immensely. So, um, I think that's it. Any last questions before I log off? I, I know this was a long class. Um, but, uh, hopefully I covered everything. When Lichi says it can, uh, it can support some islands that look easy to do. I think it's related to the current support tip diameter. Um, not the diameter, but the tip length. So let me see if I can actually demonstrate that. Yeah, you're very welcome, you guys. Very welcome. Let's see if I can I can answer that question real quick. So let's do a search at 50 microns. Um, and then we're going to place some auto supports. 
and then I'll show you one thing you can you can look at. So there's 12 supports left. It can't auto place 12 supports. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my tip length to three millimeters and then try again. I'm going to change it to four millimeters and try again. See, at four millimeters, it was able to place another island for me. And then I'll change it to 1.5 millimeters and try again. And sometimes you might find that changing your, there we go, two more supports got placed because I had a, a one millimeter tip length. Um, so sometimes you can kind of tweak it like that, get a few extra auto placed and give you a little extra, uh, a little less work. So, um, all right, guys, that's it. Thanks so much, uh, for hanging out. Um, I'm super glad you guys came. Um, go ahead and check out our discord. Let me post our discord again. If you haven't joined already. Um, so, so I wish I could tell you, like, I, I can't put words into how great everybody is on our discord. Just the nicest group of people. Um, that they're always willing to help give advice, tell you what you're doing is awesome. Um, you know, anything you need, we're going to be there. I am always, it's on all the time for me. I'm as active as I can be. Um, we have people who do live streaming. We have people who are painters. We have illustrators. We got a couple of guys who are battle map cartographers. You can actually like ask them to make you a map. Um, and, and they'll help you make a map. Um, you can check out our website is tableflipfoundry.com. Uh, we have an Etsy store. Uh, we're starting to branch out some of our stuff. Um, we actually have a, a couple, let me see if I can pull it up for you guys. Um, we have some merch that I just started rolling out. So if you, uh, if you are so inclined and really want puck on a t-shirt, uh, you can order puck, <laughs> uh, from our, our page. And then we're working on maps. We only have one up right now. Um, and then things like custom character sheets. Man, check this out. We have a, an artist who hand draws these character sheets. So if you have a fighter or a barbarian, you want to, you want a custom character sheet for them. You should go check those out. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, we will do like, I know we got into some more detailed supports, um, support related stuff here but there's way more um info i can give you on how to hand play supports the same way that we do for professional pre-supporting um so if you really want like the highest quality you can get out of your model um you want it to be removed easy you, you just want the best the best of the best i do teach a pre-support class uh it'll probably be next week most likely two weeks away um where i'll do that this video will be up on our YouTube channel. That's uh, Table Flip Foundry on YouTube. You can find some really cool stuff over there. Um, I try to occasionally post some. Oops, that's studio. I don't want studio. I want our channel. Um, I occasionally post uh, some tutorials. I did like an airbrush station. If you want to build your own airbrush station, um, some vat cleaning options. Um, you can see some old videos. I 3d printed the entire wave echo cave. So if you want to just see something stupid, um, also we post our, some of our pre-support classes over there. So, uh, that's everything I got for you guys tonight. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Thank you so much for all the questions. Hopefully I got to all of them. Uh, I love you guys very much. I hope to see you on our discord. Uh, have a good night. I guess we're not starting soon. We're logging out. <laughs> See you guys.